Jason from the Gaslight Victory Theater. And uh, hey, thanks for uh, downloading this or tuning in or whatever you say on this internet thingy. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to be reading the uh, ninth chapter of the original Adventures of Hank the Cowdog uh, by John R. Erickson today to go along with our, our quarantine reading. Um, we've been having a pretty good time. If you'd like to uh, know more about Hank the Cowdog, of course, you can look in the uh, up above in the uh, section there in the comment section down below. Either place, you should be able to find a uh, uh, couple of links, one to the uh, original Hank the Cowdog Facebook page and one to the uh, website uh, for Hank the Cowdog where you can download all kinds of fun stuff. And so uh, you, you ought to take a look at that. Um, these are hard times uh, for us and for you and for everybody. Um, and I just wanted to let you know if you were interested in helping out the Gaslight Baker Theater in some way, uh, go to our website and uh, check it out. It's mygbt.org. And if you run over to the little section in the bottom that says donate, you can send us a little money uh, to help out in these difficult times because uh, like a lot of theaters all over the country, we're not bringing any income right now. So we'd appreciate your help. Uh, just go find it and look at and pay through PayPal or whatever. And uh, we look forward to actually having you back in the auditorium with us. Anyway, enough of that. I'm going to read. Chapter 9. Me, just a worthless coyote. That business about the secret was the perfect stroke, and it probably saved my life. In desperation, I had lucked into it. Turns out that coyotes are superstitious animals, even though they are known to be cunning and vigilant. 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 I don't know how to spell that word. <laughs> Who spelling is a pain in the neck. I do my best with it, but I figure if a guy has tremendous gifts as a writer, his audience will forgive him a few slip-ups in the spelling department. I mean, it doesn't take any brains to open a dictionary and look up a word. Anybody can do that. The real test of a writer comes in the creative process. I try to attend to the big picture, but don't you see? Let the spelling just take care of itself. Vigilant, vigilant. Oh, it still doesn't look right. Anyway, coyotes are superstitious brutes. And that deal about the secret caught them just right and saved my hide. Actually, it did better than that. It made me kind of a celebrity in the tribe. And I was treated like a visiting dignitary, dignitary, who cares, uh, by everyone but Scrunch, that is. And he continued to give me hateful glances and mutter under his breath every time our paths crossed. I couldn't blame him for being sore. I had won and he had lost. And you can't expect everybody to be a good loser. As we say in the security business, show me a good loser, and I'll show you a loser. Scrunch had lost a big one, and I was confident that he would hate my guts forevermore. <laughs> Even though there was a good chance that I would eventually become his brother-in-law. And you know, when Missy had first mentioned that possibility, it hadn't struck me as a real good idea. I suppose at that time I was still thinking of going back home and back to Drover and Pete and the chickens, the sewers, uh, the cowboys, my old job. But, but a couple of days in the Coyote Village pretty much convinced me that I had found my true place in the world as a savage. <laughs> now, the life of a savage ain't too bad. I admit that I was raised with a natural prejudice, prejudice, uh, yeah. A natural bias against coyotes. Ma always told us that we, that they were lazy, sneaky, undisciplined, and didn't have any ambition. But what chapped her the most about coyotes was that they ate rotten meat and it made them smell bad. True, every word of it. But what she didn't tell us was that all that laziness and riotous living can be a lot of fun. I don't blame her for not telling us that part. I mean, she was trying to raise a litter of registered paper, blue ribbon, top of the line cow dogs. And there's no better way to mess up a good cow dog than to let him discover that goofing off beats the heck out of hard work. I discovered it by accident. Once I had a taste of indolence, I loved it. I mean, all at once I had no responsibilities, no cares, no worries, 
when I woke up in the morning, I didn't have to wonder if my ranch had made it through another night or if I'd get yelled at again for something I hadn't done. About a week after I joined the tribe, I made friends with these two brothers named Rip and Snort. <laughs> they were what you'd call typical good old boy coyotes. Filthy. Smelled awful. Not real smart. Loved to fight and have a good time and had no more ambition than a couple of fence posts. If Rip and Snort took a shine to you, you had two of the best friends in the world. If they didn't happen to like your looks or your attitude, you were in a world of trouble. I got along with them. One evening, long towards sunset, they came around and asked if I wanted to go carousing. I was feeling refreshed since I'd slept a good part of the day. I got up around noon, ate a piece of rabbit that Missy had caught, then went back to bed. I was all rested up and said, sure, I'd love to go carousing. So off we went, me and Rip and Snort on a big adventure. We went down the canyon, crossed that big sandy draw that cuts through there, then on across some rolling country till we came to an old silage pit. I'd been by it many times, but I'd never taken the time to go into the pit and check things out. By the time I took over the ranch, the cowboys had quit feeding silage, so I didn't know much about it. One of the things I didn't know about silage was that it's fermented, which means it's got some alcohol in it, which means that if a guy eats enough of it, his attitude about the whole world begins to change. All those years I'd spent on the ranch, and I never knew any of that, but Rip and Snort knew all about silage, yes they did, and they had made a well-packed trail into and out of the silage pit. So we started eating silage. Struck me as kind of bitter at first, but the more I ate, the less I noticed the bitterness. By George, after about an hour of that, I thought it was as sweet as honey. <laughs> well, we ate, and we laughed, and we laughed, and we ate, and when it came time to leave, Rip and Snort had to drag me out of there, fellas, because I couldn't get enough of that fine stuff. A big moon was out, and we went single file down a cow path, Snort in the lead, me in the middle, and Rip on the caboose. Funny thing, that cow path kept wiggling around, and I had a devil of a time trying to stay on it. I asked Rip about it, and he said he was having the same trouble. Dern path kept jumping from side to side. I suspect the silage had something to do with it, is what I suspect. Well, next thing I knew, Snort, top to rise, came to a sudden halt, which caused a little pileup with me running into Snort and Rip running into me because it, none of us could see real well at that point. Stop here, said Snort. Sing many songs. Sing pretty. Sing loud. Teach hunk coyote songs. So we all sat back on our ha haunches. We throwed back our heads and started singing. Let me see if I can remember how that song went. <clears throat> me just a worthless coyote. Me howling at the moon. Me like to sing and holler. Me crazy as a loon. Me not want job or duties. No church or Sunday school. Me just a worthless coyote. And I don't remember the last part. Only it rhymed with school or pool or drool or something like that. Anyway, it was a crackerjack of a song. We ripped through it a couple of times till I had her down. Then we divided up. Snort took the bass. Rip carried the melody, and I got up on the high tenor. Woo! Don't know as I ever heard better singing. <laughs> it was one of them priceless moments in life when three very gifted guys come together and blend their talents and sort of raise the cultural standards of the whole dang world. I mean, it was that good. We sang it four or five times. Then all at once, Snort's ears perked up, and he lifted his paw. And we stopped and listened. And off in the distance, we heard yapping. There was something, something familiar about that yap, but for a minute, I couldn't place it. And then it occurred to me that we were sitting on a spot just a quarter mile north of ranch headquarters. That yapping was coming from Drover. I think Rip and Snort had took a notion to amble on down there and see if they could get into a fight. I had to explain that they couldn't run fast enough to get Drover into a fight. That it would be a waste of their time. Let me go down and talk to him, 
I said, he's an old buddy of mine. We used to work together. Hey, maybe he'll come back and sing with us. Uh, we could use another guy on baritone. They shrugged. Snort sat down and started scratching his ear. More fun fight, but singing okay, too. We wait. So I trotted down to the ranch, weaving a little bit from side to side and humming, me just a worthless coyote. <laughs> that was a good song. Yeah. When I was, oh, 20, 25 yards away, I slowed to walk. I could see Drover up ahead of me. He was peering off in the distance. I, the little dope hadn't even seen me. I decided to stop and watch him for a minute. He was all bunched up and tense. Off in the distance, he could hear Rip and Snort laughing and belching and having a good time. He'd cock his head and listen for a minute. Then he'd give out a yip, yip, yip. On every yip, all four feet went up off the ground. And then he'd stop and listen again. He never saw me. Never had the slightest notion that I was sitting ten yards away from him. Watching the whole show, this was my replacement. Understand, the guy who had taken over my job as head of ranch security, I didn't need anyone to tell me that the ranch had gone completely and absolutely to pot. I cleared my throat. <coughs> Grover froze. What, 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 what was that? Who's there? What's going on, son? He gave out his usual squeak, and in a flash, he was highballing it for the machine shed, squalling like a turpentine cat. He'd maybe gone 10, 12 yards when he slowed to a walk, and then he stopped. Hank, is, is that you? Uh-huh. It, it is? Uh-huh. How, how can I be sure? I thought you left the country. Well, why don't you just trot your little self over here and see? He came real slow, a few steps at a time. It, 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 it sure sounds like you. Oh, son of a gun. You're not fooling me, are you, Hank? Get over here and quit messing around. Oh, okay, okay. I just want to be sure that's all. He came creeping up to me. Hank, boo! He screamed and jumped straight up into the air. <laughs> Hank, stop, stop, don't do that to me. My nerves. Go over, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Uh, what a pitiful excuse you are for a night watchman. I could have carried off half the chicken house. You never would have gotten the news. He hung his head. I know it. I'm a failure. Every morning I wake up and say, here's another day for you to mess up, Drover. And I do. Every one of them. It hadn't been the same since you left, Hank. Well, I knew it would, and I tried to tell them, but they wouldn't listen. I mean, you can't treat a good dog like a dog and expect to keep him. Gosh, I wish you'd come back. <laughs> you can forget that, son. It'll never happen. I have found a better life. He looked me over real careful. What, what's come over you, Hank? You look different. You, you smell different. You stink. I've joined the Coyote tribe. I heard him gasp. <gasps> no! That's right. And if you had a brain in your head, you'd come along and join up with him too. It ain't a bad life, let me tell you. He took a couple of steps back. I, I can't believe it. What would your mother say? Well, she'd say I was a turncoat and a traitor. So what? I tried the straight life. I did my job, and what did I get? Abuse, ingratitude, no thanks. Life's too short for that. I'll cast my lot with the outlaws of the world. Three weeks ago, he said in a quavery voice, you were on the side of law and order, trying to catch the murderers, and now you're one of them. That's right, he started crying. Oh, Hank, I can't take this. I, I used to admire you so much. You were my hero. I thought you were the greatest dog in the world. Since I was a pup, I, I wanted to be just like you, brave and strong and fearless. Knock it off, Drover. I don't want to hear that stuff. And, and dedicated to duty. I knew I could never be as good as you, but I wanted to try. You were my idol, Hank. Cut it out, would you? Come back home, Hanky. I need you. The ranch needs you. We all need you. Well, that kind of struck me in the heart, hearing Drover say those things. Then Rip and Snort called for me. Honk, come sing. We tired, wait. Who's that? Drover whispered. 
Oh, some of my pals. Come on up the hill with me, Drover, and I'll show you a good time. Introduce you to my friends. Are they drunk like you? Oh, now, there was a little edge in his voice. He'd never talked to me like that before. Well, maybe they are. Maybe they ain't. Who cares? I care. I don't associate with coyote trash. <laughs> well, la ti da Ain't we high and mighty tonight? Drover dried his eyes with the back of his paw. <laughs> I better get back to the ranch. I'm on guard tonight. I laughed in his face. <laughs> you're, you're on guard. Son, you're a sorry excuse for a guard dog. Running for the machine shed every time you hear a sound. I'm not going to run anymore. Somebody's got to protect the ranch. We can't depend on you anymore. You'll run. You always have. You always will. I ain't going to run. Sure you will, and I can prove it. Boo! He didn't run. That don't prove a thing. When the time comes, when the chips are down, you'll run and hide. He looked me in the eye. No, I won't. And Hank, if you come with him, I won't run from you either. He turned and started walking away. You always were a little chump. He stopped. I may be a chump, Hank, but I'm not a traitor. Goodbye. Go on, you little dummy. Who needs you anyway, sawed-off, stub-tailed, self-righteous little pipsqueak? Drover went his way, and I went mine. On my way up the hill, I could hear the boys singing, Me just a worthless coyote again. <laughs> I took my place between rip and snort, started belting on the high tenor. I, <laughs> we went on like that all night long, singing and laughing, chasing mice. But it wasn't quite as much fun this time.